chapter 20 began with uh, the elders in Babylon coming to Ezekiel to inquire of the Lord. And God was clear that he would not allow it. Why? Well, their sin, their sin of idolatry and not honoring their covenant, specifically the Sabbath. We looked at that last week. And God backs up his reasons for not letting them inquire of him by giving them a history lesson. Israel broke the covenant with God, yet throughout Israel's history, God continued to be patient and long-suffering with them. But now, judgment is coming. Babylon's rule has come in two waves to Jerusalem and to Judah already, and that final wave is on its way. This judgment is in motion, but we know that God's plan doesn't end there. With judgment also comes restoration. Pick up in verse 33. As I live, says the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with fury poured out, I will rule over you. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you were scattered with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and there I will plead my case with you face to face. Just as I pleaded my case with your fathers in the wilderness in the land of Egypt, so I will plead my case with you, says the Lord God. Now, again, history has proven that Israel has forsaken God, but God will not forsake them. He promises that his rule is coming, his way, and it'll be on his terms. And in this judgment, prior to that, God will scatter them, and it says he will bring them back. So when God brings them back, he will deal with them just like he dealt with the children of Israel when they left Egypt. And we know that story. Major miracles and events happened. And then weeks later, Israel's whining and complaining over and over again. God's patience. He does something for him. Praise the Lord. You're feeding us. I don't like manna, right? On and on and on. Verse 37, God says, I will make you pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will purge the rebels from among you and those who transgress against me. I will bring them out of the country where they dwell, but they shall not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So when they return, he uses this phrase, pass under the rod. This is a picture of sheep passing by the shepherd. The shepherd does the following when they pass under the rod. He obviously counts the sheep. He inspects them. He examines the sheep. And he then sorts the sheep. When God brings Israel back to the land, his standards of relationship will not change. The exile for Israel, the judgment of their sin, is for correction. And when he brings them back, that will still be in play. Verse 39. As for you, O house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, go serve every one of you his idols. And hereafter, if you will not obey me, but profane my holy name, no more with your gifts and your idols. For I, for on my holy mountain and on The Mount Height of Israel, says the Lord God, there all the house of Israel, all of them in the land shall serve me. There I will accept them and there I will require your offering and the first fruits fruits of your sacrifices together with all of your holy things. Now remember, history has been reviewed. Israel has a history of sin. God's history is continued mercy and grace toward them as well. And even up to this point in time, God specifically is calling out. Remember, the elders came to Ezekiel. They're inquiring of him. They've come to hear from God. So God challenges them with a decision, a decision for them to make. Will they continue serving idols or will they repent and start being obedient to the Lord? Now, there is no room 
for the double-minded man in serving the Lord. Remember our study in James. And there is also, as God references in Revelation chapter 3, we don't want to be lukewarm, riding the fence, right? Not hot, not cold. Have you realized that that, that reference in Revelation I mean, God says they're lukewarm. It, it makes them vomit. That is not a place where we want to be. See, these elders are kind of going through this interesting thing. They want to inquire of God. They want God to bless them, but they don't want to do their part of the relationship, right? Has anybody ever been in a relationship where you feel like you do all the work and that person does all the taking? See, that is not a relationship. That is dysfunction at its peak. God designed us to have a relationship with him. He will give to us, and, he will, and he, we will give back to him. Verse 41, I will accept you as a sweet aroma, and when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will be hallowed in you before the Gentiles, then you shall know that I am the Lord. When I bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for which I raised my hand in an oath to give to your fathers, and there you shall remember your ways and all your doings which were defiled, and you shall loathe yourselves in your own sight because of all the evils that you have committed. Now we've got to remember something. They, Daniel has foreseen that they will be in exile for 70 years and they will get to return back to the land. Now, this is probably, at this time, they're probably seven years into that 70 years of exile. So they got 63, a little more years left. And when they return, they're coming back to God. They will come back to God again on God's terms. His terms haven't changed. And it says that if they will do that, God will restore them. Now, we see in the book of Ezra, when Zerubbabel returned to build the temple, there was one sin that they had a problem with that they never had a problem with again, and that's idolatry. See, after 70 years of exile, they finally learned that lesson. Verse 44, then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have dealt with you for my name's sake, not according to your wicked ways, nor according to your corrupt doings, O house of Israel, says the Lord God. See, submitting to God's mercy is a really, really wonderful thing. God's ways are not our ways. And for the believer today, you and I must understand this same concept. Now, I'm pretty sure and I hope that none of you have little idols on your mantle or that you pray to or little things that you sacrifice animals to. Um, but see, we do have things that come between our relationship with God. His love is evident, especially when we submit to him, when we trust him, when we allow his blessing to flow by our obedience. And there's a couple of simple th ways to do that. First of all, we must look at sin the way God does. What God calls sin, we call sin. When he instructs, instructs us to do something, we need to do it. <laughs> when he says no, we say no. <laughs> when he says yes, we say yes, and we trust that yes. See, God is good, and he loves you. He has a plan for your life. The question is, will you allow him to carry out that plan? Will you answer the call of God? Now, most scholars believe at this point in this chapter, verse 40, 30, 45 really should be in chapter 21, and I would probably agree with that. Uh, if you anybody has a new English translation, you'll see that chapter 21 begins right here. So uh, we have four different words from the Lord that are going to come to Ezekiel to these elders, and here's what they are. Number one... <laughs> The burning forest word, which we'll get to this last part of the chapter. But number two, the sword of God, which is Babylon. Number three, two paths. And then number four, the sword of God, Babylon, against the Ammonites. 
So that's the four topics of the rest of our study tonight. Let's start with ver the first one in verse 45. God says, furthermore, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, set your face toward the south, preach against the south and prophesy against the forest land, the south, and say to the forest of the south, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I will kindle a fire in you and it shall devour every green tree and every dry tree in you. The blazing flame shall not be quenched and all the faces of the south and to the north shall be scorched by it. All flesh shall see that I, the Lord, have kindled it, and it shall not be quenched. So he says, preach against the south. So Judah and Jerusalem are portrayed here as a forest that is going to burn. Now, uh, any of you 80s and 90s kids, you know, Billy Joel never figured out who started the fire. Uh, but he thought it was always burning since the world was turning. But we see here clearly that the Lord started the fire. You, nobody got that joke? No, no Billy Joel fans? Okay, I won't sing it for you. Okay, but here we clearly see, listen, this, this fire that is kindled that is going to burn Judah, the, the, the nation, is God. And nothing will quench it. And we also see another one of Ezekiel's famous responses that we've seen quite a few times throughout this book. Verse 49, then he, I said, ah, oh Lord God, <laughs> they say of me, does he not speak in parables, right? So remember, Ezekiel is, he's quite famous for his uh, elaborate ways of expressing God's word. Uh, he, he's done some pretty interesting antics. And uh, these elders are like, okay, is he talking in parables again? I mean, what does all this mean? And Ezekiel's feeling it. So he responds, and then we go to verse chapter 21, verse 1, which is number 2, the sword of God Babylon. <clears throat> and the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward Jerusalem. Preach against the holy places and prophesy against the land of Israel and say to the land of Israel, thus says the Lord, behold, I am against you, and I will draw my sword out of its sheath and cut off both righteousness, or cut off both righteous and wicked from you. The land of Israel that God has allowed his people to inhabit is going to be completely cleaned out. God's sword will remove, and listen carefully here, the righteous and the wicked. We'll touch on that a little bit more. Verse 4, because I will cut off both righteous and wicked from you, therefore my sword shall go out of its sheath against all flesh from south to north, that all flesh may know that I, the Lord, have drawn my sword out of its sheath, and it shall not return any more. Now we see one thing here. There's no special treatment in this judgment. The righteous and the wicked are going to be judged by God in this third wave from Babylon. This third wave will not play favorites. All people will find themselves under the sword of Babylon. Now I don't know about you, but this sounds a little off. And I said, now, wait a minute. Did we not read back in chapter 18 something that seems contrary to what he's saying here? Chapter 18, verse 20 says this. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteous of the righteous shall be upon himself. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. And the wicked of the wicked shall be upon himself. Now, here, God predicts that a judgment will come on the whole nation and it will f affect everyone. Ch chapter 21, that's what's going on. See, sometimes the righteous suffer not because of judgment for their own sin, but because they live in a fallen world. Sadly, war only recognizes two groups, winners and losers. Mankind has done its best to keep the innocent safe in times of war, but it has failed to succeed in that completely. In war, 
the righteous and the wicked suffer. Now, that forest that was described in the last part of chapter 20, it said the green and the dry will burn, right? The dry that's dead, the healthy is going to burn. So we need to understand something. This is not a foreign principle. This is why I titled tonight's message Self-Inflicted. See, there are three elements of life that you and I, believer or non-believer, have to deal with. Number one, we live in a sinful, fallen world, and bad things happen, just like we're reading about this judgment coming from God, right? But there's other things that happen that are really bad in the world, and it's just because it's bad. So number one. Number two, we know that we have an enemy that will do his best to defeat you. Ephesians chapter 6 reminds us that we do not war against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, right? See, there's a spiritual element as well that we all have to deal with. Number three, this one's called self-inflicted. Self-inflicted drama. See, you and I, make bad choices, and we reap the consequences of those bad choices. Like the people of God in exile here in Babylon, these elders, they have been making bad choices even though they're in exile. And they come to God wanting help. But see, they are wanting their help. They're not wanting God's help. See, there, there's a challenge with um, dealing with some people. Uh, I'll, I'll use the example of, of, of maybe addicts. Um, you know, an addict's definition of help and your and my definition of help are really not the same. See, your and my definition of help would be we want to help them get out of the mess that they're in, start living a productive life, and get off whatever they're taking or doing. But see, their idea of help is you give them what they want so they can continue living the way they want to live. See, that's not help. And that's not what God wants for Israel. Verse 6, he says, Sigh, therefore, son of man, with a breaking heart, and sigh with bitterness before their eyes. See, the judgment breaks Ezekiel's heart, as it should everyone. God tells Ezekiel to let everyone see him cry, see his heart being broken. Why? Well, because the sin that brought this judgment, it breaks God's heart as well. Remember a couple of chapters ago, God says, listen, I, I don't find any, any excitement, grace, happiness in seeing the wicked suffer. But if the wicked chooses to not be obedient to the Lord, then that's what's coming. See, you and I would avoid a lot of drama in our lives if we would make better choices, and specifically, being obedient to the Lord. Now, I'm not talking about all that easy stuff that you find in the Bible. I'm talking about that real difficult stuff. You know, a few Sundays ago, we brought up uh, Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good and necessary for edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. That's a hard one. Because there's times we snap. There's times things come out of our mouth that shouldn't come out of our mouth. It's a bad choice. I I mean, think about it. Do you really have control out of what comes out of your mouth? Of course you do. But sometimes, let's just be honest, we like to be angry. We like to be right. We want to put somebody in their place. But that's not the Lord. Verse 7. And it shall be when you say, why are you sighing that you shall answer? Because of the news, when it comes, every heart will melt, all hands will be feeble, every spirit will faint, and all knees will be weak as water. Behold, it is coming and shall be brought to pass, says the Lord God. Now, we have seen so many prophets 
have warned Israel of this coming judgment, yet people did not take them seriously. And even at this time right now, you've got Ezekiel that is in exile in Babylon talking to the people. We've got Jeremiah back in Jerusalem, and people aren't listening. When Babylon comes this last time, there is no hope. The news of Babylon coming and what they will do will melt their hearts, as it says here. It says their hands will shake, their strength will be drained, and there's an interesting line here, and not to be gross, but it says all knees will be weak as water. See, the fear of Babylon is going to make them wet themselves. That's how scary this is going to be. Thus, Ezekiel is brokenhearted. This is serious. See, it's such a hard thing to watch people, and maybe you've seen this, to watch people react to something when they get caught in sin. It's really heartbreaking because you see this person that's gotten caught. There's tears, many, many tears. In fact, they cannot even, they can't even verbalize how sorry they are for what, what has happened. I personally have seen this many times. People that have been caught in their sin, they weep uncontrollably. You think they're broken, but not broken in the way that you would think. See, they're broken because they got caught. They cry, they say they're sorry, they want forgiveness, they want this pain and guilt to go away. But in a few days or weeks later, they're doing the exact same stuff all over again. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 says this. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Now, we talked about repentance Sunday, remember? You're going one direction, which is the wrong direction. Repentance means you stop. And you turn and you start going the right direction, right? That's what repentance means. But verse 9 gives us a little more clarity of this. Paul says, now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, right? But that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. See, godly sorrow produces repentance. Sorrow that just you feel bad because of getting caught. And you'll tell, you can tell. Maybe you've done it, but you can tell people, oh, I'm sorry, I'll never do that again. And before you know it, they're right back in the middle of the same mess. Anybody that has kids knows exactly what we're talking about, right? Anybody that has any kind of walk with doing right or wrong, you know it. I mean, I was the king of getting in trouble in school, and I would say or do whatever I had to do to get out of trouble so that I could go do it again, right? And that brings death. See, sadly, many people are sorry for getting caught but not sorry about their sin. Many times I have prayed with people, tears flowed, apologies to God, promises of change, and then they're gone. Never see them again. See, none of this happened, had to happen to Israel. They could have obeyed the prophets that were clear at this point in time that they should submit to Babylon, but they wouldn't. They continued to rebel against God distru- God's distru- instruction. And before this, they could have repented and changed their ways. I mean, th- th- it's a roller coaster ride, what we've seen with these. Remember, we've got great kings, man, things are awesome. Cleaning house, seeking the Lord. <sighs> then they're going down again, and we've got a bad king and brings all the idolatry back in. Roller coaster ride, up and down, up and down. I don't know about you, but I can look at my life and relate to that. So what is in store for any nation that refuses God's rule? God's judgment. 
So we've got the sword of God, Babylon, continuing here. Let's look at verse 8. And again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, thus says the Lord, say, a sword, a sword is sharpened and will be also polished, sharpened to make a dreadful slaughter, polished to flash like lightning. Should we then make mirth? It despises the scepter of my son as it does all wood. And he has given it to be polished that it may be handled. This sword is sharpened and it shall be polished to be given into the hand of the slayer. Now, I had to look this up. Maybe you guys are smarter than me. But has anybody ever used the term, hey, let's make mirth? Anybody ever? You ever? Did? I, I didn't know what it meant. So I looked it up. And it means to celebrate a situation and then laugh. God is saying, guys, my judgment is coming, and if you think you're going to laugh it off, you're gravely mistaken. See, this judgment has no preference in status. Even the king will not withstand it. God is putting the sword of judgment into the hand of the slayer, and we know who that is, Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon. Verse 12, cry and wail, son of man. For it will be against my people, against all princes of Israel. Terrors, including the sword, shall be against my people. Therefore, strike your thigh, because it is a testing. And what if the sword despises even the scepter? The scepter shall be no more, says the Lord. See, this judgment of God is coming also to remove the dynasty of David. See, after Zedekiah is removed, Israel will never, ever have a king of the line of David until, but we'll get to that later. Verse 14. You, therefore, son of man, prophesy and strike your hands together. The third time, let the sword do double damage. It is the sword that slays, the sword that slays the great men that enters their private chambers. I have set the point of the sword against all their gates that the heart may melt and many may stumble. Ah, it is made bright. It is grasped for slaughter. Now, again, at this time, Nebuchadnezzar has come twice. 605 B.C., Jehoiakim was king. That's when Daniel and all his buddies got taken back to Babylon. 597, he came back, Jehoiachin, or if you're looking at uh, First Chronicles, it says Jehoi uh, Jeconiah, that king was taken to Babylon. God will come and do double damage the third time, and that will be 586 B.C. Zedekiah, remember, we've looked at that already. He is captured. He's trying to escape. He's captured. All his sons are murdered right in front of his eyes, and then they put his eyes out. They put him in shackles and carry him back to Babylon. The temple is completely burned and destroyed. Double damage. Verse 16. Swords at the ready. Thrust right. Set your blade. Thrust left. Wherever your edge is ordered, I also will beat my fists together and I will cause my fury to rest I the Lord have spoken now all of this again we need to understand this very carefully this is all the Lord every maneuver every attack on Israel will be directed by God his judgment is coming and no one can stop it now uh, some guys elaborate they, they think that because Ezekiel uses all these visual aids before you know, some guys speculate that Ezekiel's probably got some sword and he's, you know, doing all these motions. Could be, I don't know, the text doesn't tell us, but uh, probably uh, wouldn't put past Ezekiel to act all this out before these elders. Now we look at number three. We have two paths uh, that are going to be described for us. Let's look at verse 18. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, appoint for yourself two ways for the sword of the king of Babylon to go. Both of them shall go from the same land. Make a sign, put it at the head of the road to the city, appoint a road for the sword to go to Rabbah of the Ammonites and to Judah and to the fortified Jerusalem. 
So Nebuchadnezzar is going to come south, and he's going to come to attack, but before he gets there, he's going to have to make a decision. Do I go left or right? Do I go left to Rabbah, to the land of Ammon, or do I go right to Jerusalem? Now again, he tells Ezekiel, God tells Ezekiel to make this sign and put it up at the end, right? You got one big arrow pointing to Rabbah, another arrow pointing to Jerusalem. That's the visual we get. Verse 21. For the king of Babylon stands at the parting of the road, at the fork of two roads, to use divination. He shakes the arrows. He consults the images. He looks at the liver. I had to look all these up, too. I didn't know what they meant. Right? So now we remember. Babylon is a pagan country, it's a pagan nation, and they do pagan things. And he's describing here some pagan things that they use for guidance or getting advice. And there's three of them listed here. It says he shakes the arrows. So in those days, here's what they would do. They would have a quiver, and they would get an arrow and write on the tip, Rabba. They get another arrow right on the tip, Jerusalem. They put it in the quiver, and they shake it around, <laughs> pull one out. That's the way we're going to go, right? That's what that means. The second one, it says he consults the images. So obviously they had their idols. They would pray to their idols. And usually there was a priest of that idol, especially with the king. So they'd pray to the idol. And then the king would look to the priest of that idol. And he go, the idol's telling you to do this. And that's what they would do. Now here's the real weird one. He looks at the liver. Now they would take a liver from a slaughtered animal, and they would compare it to the size and the shape, and I forgot to bring the picture, I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, they found this, uh, they found a few of them, but they've got this thing that looks, it looks like a big rock, but it's the shape of the liver, and it's divided into four sections, and they would cut the liver up and compare those sections to that rock of the liver they had. And so whatever the section looked like, that rock said to yes or no, uh, right or wrong, go left, you know, it, it, that's what it said. And that's how they made their decisions, right? Now, some of you, we were talking about making decisions earlier. You know, we've made bad decisions. I don't think I've ever made one that bad, right? <laughs> that's just, where did they get that? But that's what it was. Verse 22, in his right hand is the divination for Jerusalem to set up battering rams to call for the slaughter, to lift up the voice with shouting, to set battering rams against the gates, to heap up the siege mount, and to build a wall. So God will direct their pagan ritual to do his bidding. Now listen carefully. Nowhere ever in the Bible is a believer in Jesus to use this kind of nonsense. We are to be led by the Spirit of God and by God's word alone. And listen carefully, too. The Spirit of God and the Word of God will never contradict itself. If you think you're hearing something from the Spirit of God and you can't find anything in the Word of God that backs it up, you might be listening to something else, right? That's why you need to know your Bible. But, now, thinking about this for a moment, I thought, wait a minute. This should encourage us. Why? Why? Because if God's who he says he is, God can use anything he wants to speak to people. Now, what we are reading here in this weird stuff that these guys did is what I would call an exception to the rule, right? Again, we are never instructed to do any kind of anything like this. So we, there, there's an interesting principle in Scripture. Listen carefully. Sometimes there's an exception to the rule, but the exception is never the rule. Let me say that again. Sometimes there's an exception to the rule, but the exception is never the rule. Got it? See, God uses this nonsense to speak directly to Nebuchadnezzar to turn toward Jerusalem first. His superstition was used by God to carry out God's Verse 23. 
and it will be to them like a false divination in the eyes of those who have sworn oaths to them. But he will bring their iniquity to remembrance that they may not, they, they may be taken. Now, Zedekiah and his counselors swore an oath. The king, well, he, he was never really officially made king. He's a prince. Nebuchadnezzar put him in charge. He was part of David's lineage. And he made with is, uh, Judah, Jerusalem, they made an agreement with Nebuchadnezzar that they would submit to him, they would pay tax, and they would let him rule. And Zedekiah broke that oath. He decided to make a deal with Egypt instead. And God said, no, that is not acceptable to him. And God gave Israel, and remember, at this time, God gave Israel and told them to submit to Babylon because it was of God, and these guys didn't want to do it. So Zedekiah broke that agreement. Verse 24, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have made your iniquity to be remembered, in that your transgressions are uncovered, so that in all your doings your sins appear, because you have come to remembrance, you shall not you shall be taken in hand. So all this sin that's going on is so bad that no one would ever forget it. Nebuchadnezzar is not going to forget it because he's just been betrayed. And God's not forgetting it either because of their disobedience. Verse 25, now to you, O profane, wicked prince of Israel, Zedekiah, whose day has come, whose iniquity shall end, thus says the Lord God, remove the turban and take off the crown. Nothing shall remain the same. Exalt the humble and humble the exalted. So the day is coming. Zedekiah is going to be judged. This turban, that's the headdress of a priest. The crown, the headdress of a king, all of that will be removed and nothing will remain going forward. Nothing will ever be the same for Israel. And then he says this, exalt the humble and humble the exalted. Now, what a powerful statement against the cruelty, the wickedness, and the pride of man. So Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, he said to them, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Humility goes a long, long way with God. Verse 27, overthrown, overthrown, I will make it overthrown. It shall no longer, it shall be no longer until he comes whose right is it is and I will give it to them. So we've got overthrown emphasis, right? So this is, this is all done. There's an emphasis three times. This prideful reign of the kings and priests of Israel, God's people, will be no more until he comes whose right it is and I will give it to him. The Messiah, Jesus. I'm going to give you a little homework. If you'll write down this, and I encourage you to read over it. Think about what we're talking about here. This is a, a, a wonderful prophetic word of the Messiah coming. But write down Genesis chapter 49, verses 9 through 12. And I want you to compare these two areas. And if you, really, if you want to get an A, you want to get a gold star, then shoot me a text and tell me what you, what you got out of it, okay? See, the first coming of Christ was to save mankind. The second coming of Christ will be to rule and to reign. The rightful King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus, will be on the throne. It's exactly what he's telling us here. John chapter 12, verse 31, Jesus said this, And I, I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. See, the life and death and resurrection of Jesus changes everything for everyone, the true Messiah. Now, finally, uh, remember that sign on the road with Ezekiel. One went to Rabbah, 
He was told to make for Nebuchadnezzar, one to Rabba, one to Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar chose Jerusalem. Now it's time for Babylon to go back and go left. The final one, verse 28, the sword of God Babylon against the Ammonites. And you, son of man, prophesy and say, thus says the Lord God concerning the Ammonites and concerning their reproach. And say, a sword, a sword is drawn, polished for slaughter, for consuming, for flashing, while they see false visions for you, while they divine a lie to you to bring you to the necks of the wicked and slaying those whose day has come, whose iniquity shall end. Now, Jeremiah chapter 27 and chapter 49 uh, all prophesy about um, Nebuchadnezzar defeating Ammon. Here, Ezekiel gives the same word from the Lord. Israel will end up coming back to their land, but the Ammonites, they will die off and never return. Verse 30, return it to its sheath. The sword of judgment's over. I will judge you in the place where you were created in the land of your nativity. I will pour out my indignation on you. I will blow against you with the fire of my wrath and deliver you into the hands of brutal men who are skillful to destroy. You shall be fuel for the fire. Your blood shall be in the midst of the land. You shall not be remembered for I, the Lord, have spoken. So once this judgment is completed by Babylon, Ammon will there will no longer be a people of Ammon. Now, we got to remember what Ammon is. So if you're looking at a map and you got Israel right here, you've got Ammon, Moab, and then Edom. That's to the east. We know Edom, the Edomites, that's Esau. Ammon and Moab, those are the two sons that came from the incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughters. Okay, that's, that's their, uh, where they came from. The Ammonites and the Moabites, when Israel came out of Egypt, uh, you know, so here's Israel, you know, they, they're coming from over here. God has them come up here and come back this way, right? He doesn't, you know, we would think he would come this way, but he hasn't come around. God never told Israel to take those lands. They asked for permission to pass through, and they wouldn't do it. Ammon and Moab are the ones that hired Balaam, right, to place a curse on Israel. And God wasn't having it. You can look that story up later. See, Ammon, the Bible tells us, had a horrible, horrible sin that God is not happy with at all. In Amos chapter 1, the Bible tells us that Ammon were the people that ripped women open to kill their unborn babies. There's no Ammonites anymore. Now, I don't want to end on such a horrible, horrible thought. We, we have to understand that we take that God is serious about sin and that he will judge sin, and if you think you're getting away with it, you're not going to get away with it for very long, and if you know somebody and you think they're getting away with it, or they think they're getting away with it, you just need to know, God will judge sin. It's just a matter of time. But we can never mistake God's patience and grace for his approval, right? And that's what these people did, and sometimes we do it too. But... There are these three elements in life that we have, a de have to deal with, and let's review those one more time. You and I live in a sinful, fallen world, and bad things happen, right? It's just the way it is. We also have an enemy that will do his best to defeat us. We also have self-inflicted drama. You and I have made bad choices, and we reap the consequences of those bad choices. But see, we also have a choice to make that can bring life and blessing to our lives. And I want to end with a couple of verses from the New Testament. John chapter 17, verse 15 through 17. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. 
They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. This is Jesus praying for us. Right? So listen, it's, it's not about him delivering you out of every stinking bad thing that you've ever gone through happened. It's about him being with you in spite of those things. Okay? Another one, Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Okay? Have you ever met an Eeyore Christian? Okay? You know who Eeyore is, right? Winnie the Pooh? And what's that cartoon? Eeyore, how you doing? Good. I'm fine. Been pretty are you <laughs> okay but listen don't be an Eeyore Christian we need to live in what God has done for us we have the ability to make good choices we have the amazing wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit that is not only with us but lives in us okay see there's amazing thing what Paul said in Philippians chapter 4 He is talking about all the challenges that happened in his life. And he says something to this effect. He says, listen, I have been in a place where I haven't had a roof over my head and I've had to sleep outside. He said, I've also been in a place where I've had plenty to eat. My stomach's been full. And I've also been where I've been pretty hungry and didn't have anything. He says, also, there's been a time where I've had plenty of provision. And then there's times that I have had nothing. Now listen, this is the context of this verse. And he says, but I know that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, my circumstances, my peripheral should never control who God says I am or who I should be. Amen? Amen. And we need to, man, we need to get out of that. And listen, if you struggle being an Eeyore Christian sometime, right? Counseling 101, stop it, (laughs) right? There is no reason. God has and he will and he will continue to love you. He will continue to bless you. But we need to be obedient. It just isn't going to happen. 